and um, thank you very, very much for coming along this evening. We've got a very mixed and interesting group sat this side of the table, as we have this side as well, from executive MPAs to current students to alumni. But you've all got one thing in common. You've all got a couple of years minimum and you're all interested in what it's like on the other side. So without further ado, I'd just like to say thank you very, very much to all our panel and to Alberto for agreeing to chair this evening's event. Everything is being recorded. It's going to be shared with our colleagues from around the world who can't be here this evening. And this is a very global institution, as I'm sure you know, um, so there is a lot of interest process from all walks of life and all geographies. Um, so I'm going to pass over now to Alberto for what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting and stimulating debate. Thank you, Alberto. Hello, good evening. Thank you much for uh, joining us today. And uh, one of the things I'd like to say from the outset is that it'd be great if this uh, session were as fruitful as possible for all of you. So we're going to speak a little bit, we're going to introduce ourselves somewhat, but really it's about answering some of the questions that you might have and guiding the conversation along the sort of concerns or, or aspirations or, or views that you might, uh, want, might want to bring to the fore. So that's what I'll say from the outset. Uh, my name is Alberto Ligi, I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer for the Novak Djokovic Foundation, and I've been both in the private sector and the nonprofit space, and I've made that transition. And there's, there's good and bad on both sides. And, uh, and I think uh, for what it's worth, I'll, I'll say this, that uh, that transition is, is probably easier now than it's ever been. Uh, so maybe you'll find that hard uh, as, as a starting shot. I'll introduce the panel in, in no particular order. So, and they'll introduce themselves, I suppose. But maybe we can start on, on my right with Elia, and, uh, and we can take it along this way. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Alia. Um, I started my career in consulting with Accenture um, and uh, I actually joined Accenture for, for a very specific reason and that is they ran a program called um, Accenture Development Partnerships um, which was um, consulting for charities and nonprofits. Um, took a couple of years to actually get on that program and actually do some work in that space. But once I had, I knew that that's the area I wanted to stay in. Um, and so after I left, I went back to university, I did my master's. Um, and then I did a fellowship with a company called Acumen, which is an impact investing fund. Um, and after my year fellowship, where I was based uh, in Kenya working with a solar products company, um, I joined Acumen full time, really looking at um, how we drive and grow their ecosystem of different types of stakeholders and really accelerate the change um, that they are creating uh, with regards to poverty as well. Um, I then had to move back to London um, and I joined On Purpose, which is where I am right now. Um, it's a organization that puts um, and is really trying to create leadership potential for the social sector. Okay, my name is Garcia Williamson. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see you. Um, I've had a long and very varied career, which I think can be characterized by probably three different strands. The functional strand was I started life as an environmental scientist, went into operations management, and then found myself in human resources and uh, have focused really for the last 25 years in talent, leadership development, organisational change. Uh, the sectoral experience I've had has also been very varied. I started in um, economic development, uh, working for Scottish Enterprise, bringing in with investment into Scotland at the time. Uh, interesting stuff going on there today, I must say. And um, moved through retail, hospitality, and uh, ended up in KPMG in consulting and professional services. And it was from there that I made my transition into, profession, uh, into the not-for-profit sector, moving to Cancer Research UK, which is the largest cancer charity in the UK. Um, my third area of transition 
was work-life balance, I guess, and the personal side, because obviously when I first started out as a post-grad, I was full-time working. I then had five children in fairly quick succession, so I did some part-time working. I then set up my own company and was self-employed for a while because that fitted better. As they grew older, I moved into the um, full-time work again. And now in the twilight of my career, I'm actually operating more as an interim and freelancer, having just left Cancer Research UK. Thank you. I'm Helen McArdle, um, and I might go back a bit further than you in that this is relevant. I'm a farmer's daughter. I did pharmacy sector, working first of all for hospital pharmacy community, and then for some of the big names that you will know, like Pfizer, particularly in sales and distribution. Um, and then I went to Africa. Well, actually, I married a man. He was a brewer in Guinness. and. Uh, Nigeria is the biggest population for drinking Guinness. <laughs> so, so there's 130 million people who really believe in it, never mind the Viagra or any of that sort of thing. Guinness was great and we did fabulous time. Now I'm telling you this because all of it is really relevant and kind of like your story, it's the happenstance of your life that often makes you really suitable to get into a not-for-profit. Um, when we returned, I would have quoted that we returned from uh, Nigeria um, I had uh, two children, an ability to play golf badly and to drink gin well, so that kind of went on my CV. Uh, having said that, in pharmacy I never wrote a CV, but then we bought a house uh, not far within this location and it was just too expensive, so I needed a job. And I met um, my babysitter, and I'm Irish so you know how this will work, and her father was in recruitment. Oh, I've heard of that, yes. There are people that get jobs for people, and I met him at the county fair, and he gave me a job, because I did come on with an MBA as well. And from then on, I started working with people to find them jobs. Uh, I returned to Dublin, and somebody rang us up one day to know if we could get a rice geneticist for them. And they were down in the Philippines. Now, at this point, there was Uncle Ben's and Pilau and a few more rices. But really, what else is there to it? And there started a journey that has been fabulous. The organization is called IRI. It's the International Research, Rice Research Agency uh, Institute. Uh, they are bringing crops to the fore that are dealing in, let's say, can tolerate salinity and things like that. Uh, we worked with the research organizations that took us into multilateral banks. We worked with donors, um, the likes of the Bill and Melinda Gates organizations. So we're looking for leaders for, for these organizations. So you can be any place in this from a botanist to an economist to a CEO and find a place in it. And it is about the individual about making the transition. We're looking for, for instance, investment bankers, and you think, oh, all of those are on Wall Street, aren't they? No, actually, the Asia Development Bank at the moment would kill for some of them to go and come from the private sector and go and join them in Manila to build capital projects all over Asia. So it's very exciting. And the farmer piece that I started off with, I found myself in Nepal on a farm, taking a picture of a tractor that I was going to take home from my, to, to my dad. So your whole history can come together in a career, and it's very rewarding when you can do that. If you ask what you bring from private sector to, to the not-for-profit, I would say it's focus, because you're always responding in the private sector to the share price. What's happening? Is it up? Is it down? Somebody is on your case. In the not-for-profit um, sector, impact and outcomes are very hard to actually monitor. And now the challenges are climate change, food, and water. That's what's happening in the world. And in there, if you can contribute, it's a major uh, element in life. I leave it at that. That sounds very good. That sounds very good. <laughs> so before we move on to my left side, um, so my background used to be in finance and management consulting. Um, I studied management here at the LSC. I uh, did a master's in management uh, about 20 years ago, or just about, and uh, I found that very useful. And uh, a little introduction, dealing with my net worth individuals and uh, income generation and, and so forth, and gradually started getting involved with philanthropy. 
through social investing, impact investing, uh, that became more of a pronounced component within the conversations that I was having in the, in the private sector. To me, there's, there's, you know, there was more to life than just meeting Q3 targets for shareholders. And I thought, okay, let's let's take the plunge, and I did, and, and I never looked back. And I'm very happy that that I did so. And what I would say is that uh, if you're at all curious about it, and I think you are by the fact that you're here in an evening, then uh, I would highly encourage you to explore that further. Uh, the work that we do here at the here that I do at the Novak Djokovic Foundation is extremely rewarding, and I work with a, with a very great and diverse team. We do a lot in early childhood education and early childhood development. <coughs> And we engage not just on the ground in Serbia and building schools and, and uh, delivering some very high quality teacher training, but we also work globally with UNICEF for the Goodwill Ambassador Program and with the World Bank, whereby we have an investment, um, they have an investment of 50 million into Serbia and we have an MOU with them. Um, and ensuring that that country that's of importance to us is looked after uh, in terms of early childhood development. And that's incredibly rewarding. And so, if you're at all curious, uh, this is uh, this is the sensible first step, and uh, and I thank you for for being here tonight. Okay, Jane. That's a lot to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> My name's uh, Kerry Jane Lowry. Um, I've been in and out of humanitarian work for about two, 22 years. Um, I started once I finished uh, college in the States. I um, I. I wanted to work in the humanitarian sector, but it was very difficult to get into at a young age. So um, I worked for an auction house and then for the Daily Telegraph. And then I resigned because they stopped the river bus and uh, the tube journey was just too long. So I went back to Switzerland, taught skiing, and money to then go to India and work with lepers to see if that's what I wanted to do. I was a voluntary worker, so I thought, okay, I'll do this for a few months. And then um, when I got back, that book, I needed to earn money. So I applied to the UNHCR and the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they offered me a job within a few months. Um, so that I passed their very intense training, which, uh, which was quite intense. <laughs> Um, and then they shipped me off to all sorts of places like Rwanda to work with the genociders, Peru to work with the hostage takers during the Emirtia coup. Um, I was in Colombia, I was in all, all sorts of places, including the Balkans, um, where I did a long study of the displaced populations from Kosovo after the war and uh, wrote a lot of policy to try and turn around the, the country that was facing. Uh, with all the you know the various populations that they had. Um, while I've been doing that, I've also I'm a very keen photographer, so I've also had photography exhibitions and things like that. And um, I stopped after two years at headquarters um, in Geneva. I stopped, and I became a full-time writer. So I was the um, editor of some magazines like Power Sports magazine. Um, I was the editor of a magazine for high-class hotels. Um, I wrote a book about particle physics for CERN. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I did different things. And um, included, I wrote a website for clients who had a big rice company. <laughs> I wrote about all the varieties of rice, which is interesting. Um, and then the ICRC was looking for a writer to send to um, uh, Israel in the occupied territories. And they wanted someone who had Red Cross experience. So I, yeah, um, and uh, they sent me there. Um, so I worked there for a, about a year. And then the Gaza war, Gaza war started. So my role kind of shifted. And I was dealing with all the uh, problems surrounding, you know, our websites, etc., to report what we could report because the ICLC doesn't really say much. Um, and then I worked for a bit at a Palestinian university. Um, and then I was kind of chucked out of the country because I, I was illegally there after a while. Not while I was with the ICLC, but afterwards. And um, so I came back to Switzerland, had a little bout of PTSD, as you do. Um, and I've recently moved to England, and I'm continuing with my photography and with uh, my writing. I'm attempting to write young adult fiction, which is a complete change for me. 
um, and also looking, you know, at other possibilities just to kind of work in a team because otherwise it's all a bit lonely. That's my story. Right. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Crone. Um, so after completing my English degree, I had a very short foray into journalism um, and also worked uh, for an editorial agency whose primary client was Johnson & Johnson. So I was working on um, primarily healthcare communications. Um, and from there, I moved to Save the Children um, and worked as a writer and editor there for several years um, in their marketing and communications department. And then I decided to have um, a little experiment and go to the dark side and uh, work for an advertising agency, um, Coca-Cola and Tesco. So it really was <laughs> the most dramatic change I could have. Um, so as a senior copywriter for them, um, and I also worked in some of their corporate social responsibility projects too. Um, I kind of realised where my heart was and what I really wanted to do, um, which then had led me to my current role at Amnesty International as a digital engagement specialist. Um, so basically what that means is um, I create and strategise on our digital campaigning and communications across all of our digital channels. Um, across a range of different issues that we work on, so women's rights, immigration, and asylum, torture, um, humanitarian crises, um, and also getting to work on some of our more innovative tech projects as well. So um, we've done a virtual reality project around um, Syria, which involved working with activists, media activists who are actually in Aleppo um, and Kind of training and providing them with equipment to take virtual reality 360 degree videos and images um, which we then able to share with supporters both on the streets and online as well. Excellent. Well that sounds very interesting. I think we have a very diverse panel. <laughs> I hope everybody can hear us. I know we don't have any microphones this evening uh, but if anybody struggles then just let us know we'll up the volume a little bit. Um, before we progress, perhaps it might be sensible to get an idea of who the audience is. And I think we have an idea, but I'm not quite sure that that's the case. I know it's this session because I can see people standing in the back, which is great. Um, who's doing, um, and there are a couple of seats here, by the way. So there are two seats, three seats. Who's doing an MPA here? OK. I guess it's not a coincidence that everybody's on that side of the room. <laughs> and um, who's an alum from the school? And and, and current students, non-NPA? OK. And in terms of your interests for joining us tonight, is that you're, you're, um, you're just exploring what the nonprofit world might have to offer and you think might be of interest? or? Uh, me, um, I'm part of the EMPA contingent, and um, I'm an engineer. Engineering, so, okay. and I've worked in engineering for the last twelve years. I actually have a PhD in water, in wastewater. Okay. So, um, the motivation behind doing the MP EMPA was to sort of veer into a multilateral institution or something to do with water policy. And so. Okay. So this is great for someone like me, and I think. A lot of us are in the, in the same Okay. Area. And are there other stories that aren't necessarily like that or revolving around that? But sure. Um, I'm an alumni and um, I'm currently working um, in the kind of consulting field. So it's moving from um, my current um, company, Corporate World, into not for profit. I've had previous not for profit experience, moved out to try and build the experience, and now it's just trying to come back. Mm -hmm. so, Okay, and I see some heads nodding, so that's similar. Yeah. And um, and before we pass it on to the panel, uh, in terms of success thus far, have you guys tried and perhaps been a bit frustrated by the outcomes? Or yeah, yes. And then the feedback was just what? Keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, Can I just add to that? Sorry. Sure. Um, I think for me, it's been really difficult trying to pigeonhole what I can do within the industry. Um, the roles are not, I mean, when I look on the websites and so on, they're not quite, they're not that obvious. So, but we did uh, get some feedback on mm -hmm. how things were from look all for people with okay. high profile and so on. I know that's a bit specific, but. Sure. You know, Okay, great. Well, I'm just thinking, start with our expert headhunter <laughs> for some of the, of, of, the, of the structural side of things, and then we can get more into the anecdotal maybe. Yeah. Um, I suppose just some general comments. Um, the division between for-profit and not-for-profit is actually merging. Um, the you need to do your job well, whichever one you're working for. It's key to being successful on either side of the fence. Um, you, going into not-for-profit to be closer to field work, etc., um, is you know, very worthwhile if that's what rewards you, like in Kerry Jane, that she was actually in the field. But if you can be a really good economist, accountant, internal auditor, etc., and be as good in a not-for-profit as you are in a for-profit, the big problem at the moment is that there is about 25% less money to go around. I don't know what's happening in your um, um, agency, but a lot of the donors just don't have the money. And it's probably a sign that they're trying to make it a bit more efficient on for-profit, they're trying to make money. Profit, they're spending money, disbursement of money. That's one I think the key basics that you have to get somebody's head around. So if you're spending money, we all like to spend it, there's got to be an impact and an outcome. So it's not as measurable, and organizations like yourselves, when you give away money, you want to go, okay, what can I see for my money? And heretofore, there's been very little measurement. So this is going to finish within, I would say, the next 10 years. So it comes back to get your CV out. Do a CV irrelevant of whether you're going profit or not for profit and be as good as you can in whatever your career takes you to. Go into those organizations knowing that they have opportunities. And if I may take the, the lady who's the engineer over here, just to give you an example, and to go back to Asia Development Bank, they want engineers at the moment because they're investing millions into building and billions into capital projects. They don't know how to build bridges. They know procurement and how to write contracts, but people are coming in and saying, the bridge is going to cost you 10 billion. No, they don't know any better. So they need engineers to go in and say, you don't need that strength of steel. Uh, you need a classic example they gave. So somebody said the water main needs to be three meters wide. Well, most people don't know what that means. It could, in our houses, it's that wide. But actually, it was three times bigger than it was needed. So they need people, engineers with a water background, to be able to look at what they're funding and tell them whether they can love them or not. So all those jobs are there. The days of Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy are gone. It's about situations, and I need to. Per I'll get a computer first because you don't have to love them and you can leave them for the weekend. But if you can't get that, you need a person. And I think if you listen to the complexity of the panel here, we're, I wondered for a minute, are we all a bit weird? But it's the diversity of life <laughs> that will bring you to, to being able to deliver. So, key, it's the same profit or not for profit. Would you think? Let me just follow up. So, are you saying perhaps if, if somebody's looking at a CV within the nonprofit space? They're trying to assess its merit, um, and you're and you're highlighting perhaps that nonprofits have been less than adequate at times in quantifying impact. Is it then in these CVs there might be something to be said for uh, putting in some numbers, putting in some figures, putting in something that would indicate an ability to critically assess the the investment potential or, or returns on something? Just a question, Adam. Yeah, no, you're right. There's still nothing like on time and on budget. You don't have to have that many more numbers, if whether it's private or not for profit, you can put on time and on budget. 
they know you understand the importance of it and therefore it carries across the, the whole spectrum of what you need to do. Uh, international experience is very, very important. Just talking about volunteering and going out and, and your experience, KJ, because when you go to some foreign countries, countries, you're so assailed by the difference of them that you can't do a tough job, survive in a family life, and then have to report to all over the world for different reasons. So foreign experience is very important to have actually lived and worked in these countries, if at all possible. You don't always have, have it for six months. That still helps. You would be amazed. In the panel here, um, so you guys have all made that transition, but I'm curious in terms of having been responsible at all for recruiting or being in the decision-making process of bringing in new talent into new nonprofits. I imagine, Garcia, you obviously were because you were heading up HR and cancer research, but I'm not sure if, if, if you have or if any of you have. And what are just some of the things that maybe strike you as must-haves, if there are such things, or? Interject first, sure. just say that, you know, one of the things that I think I used to look for in the talent and the potential of people joining was flexibility. So although you have a very defined set of skills and experience, it's thinking about how you can apply those in different situations and having that mindset, which means you are open to perhaps taking a bit of a risk and trying something different as well. Because in a lot of charities, not-for-profits, they don't have the luxury of having all of the resources and all the different job roles that you see in some of the bigger corporates. So you may have to wear several hats. And for some people, that's really frightening. For others, it's so exciting. And it gives you the opportunity to just get so many more skills under your belt. I think, I think the thing um, that I would say is that it's no different applying to a private sector job. And so you should still have the same attention to detail. And you should still be selling yourself in the same way. Um, and I would say that start from where, like, what do you have to offer? So a lot of people that I speak to say, oh, I'm an accountant and I want to do something completely different that has nothing to do with their skill sets. And that's fine. And you can get there someday if that's really what you want to do. But there may be stepping stones to getting to that um, or situation that you want to work in. And so I really say, start from what you have to offer. So if you're an accountant and you're a good accountant, then maybe start in the in the um, not-for-profit sector with those skills. Get to understand an issue area or um, a, a subset of the sector in a bit more detail. And then your next step can be like, look, I understand this issue area really well, and I have these skill sets, but I want to build investing um, understanding. Maybe there's a role that I can do that's um, a little bit more linked to that. And so it's not just um, I'm really passionate and I'm really excited and let me go do this thing that I don't actually have any skills to do. That's like one of the most common things that I see. Um, and it's admirable, but it's really hard to recruit into an organization when our appetite for risk on talent is actually really low. Um, and we just don't have the funds to be able to take that risk um, in the same way as maybe much larger um, organizations with a lot of money can. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I don't know if it's more specific for an operational role, such as something in marketing and communications. I don't know if any of you are thinking of that area specifically. Um, but certainly in my experience, the number one thing that we would be looking for is solid experience in marketing and communications. And if you've got that, then that would really do a you know, 99% of the job, really. Um, so yeah, like you said as well, but that's, that's definitely the, the key thing. Obviously, a passion for the cause and interest in issues is a bonus too, but um, experience in those areas because they're completely applicable when it comes to operational roles. I'd say one thing, and, and yeah, I, mean, I haven't thought about your point, but it's true. You, you get people coming out of that field, and you're thinking, well, where is the relevance here to, to what you actually want to do? Um, I like the word narrative, you know, in developing a narrative. What's your story? And it might be that you're an accountant and you really 
into grant making or, or projects or something that isn't necessarily the finance function of that organization. A, a, obviously you want some transferable skills, but I think that term transferable skills carries weight. People are embracing that. Uh, but what is the narrative? How are you going to sell them on the reason why you're doing this and, and coming across credibly? Because I think if you don't come across credibly, they're surely not going to believe you if you don't believe it yourself. So somehow you need to figure out and connecting those dots. What, what, what's the audience thinking in terms of um, where they'd like to work? Uh, and I don't so much mean in terms of organizations, but the functions within these organizations. Where, where are people leaning towards? Um, communications. So. OK. Education. In terms of? Tell me. Uh, so my history is I've worked with NGOs before where I found pay was higher than working with government as it was my position now. But I find that I get uh, interviewed for lower positions than what I should be doing. So they, they're more interested in me going at entry level after 20 years of experience. But it's education reform, uh, building schools, all that stuff. Kind of stuff. How are you applying to these organizations when you're saying that you're, you're coming in at the entry level? Of so, Adarwa or Esqua, for example, let's say, they basically, any job that I apply to that's a higher level, I get an automatic rejection. Anything that's a lower level, they're more willing to do the test and interview for. But then, everything. But it just feels like it's very conflicting. It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It kind okay. of undermines you. So you're like, why would I do that? Sure, sure, sure. Now we're going to do, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I have similar experience to Shadi in the water, in the water business, but the one thing I found a little bit sort of um, confusing is that I, I always worked in the, pri in the private sector. Uh, well, I had the technical background, but I was always on the commercial side, basically bringing business to the organizations. And the reason I wanted to make the shift, uh, the reason I'm studying this course is I sort of got enough for uh, uh, um, sort of trying to make money to shareholders, as you mentioned earlier, and thought of, okay, I want to make the shift rather than making the money to shareholders. Let, let me think of the bigger picture. Let's let's think of why the project or the schemes are going in place, or let's shape at institution level. But the skills that I have are basically when you translate them in the uh, non-profit uh, world is basically working as a lobbyist or as a, someone that can secure the fund and uh, it's, it's still doing business but when I look at the descriptions it says okay have you done fundraising no I haven't done fundraising but I've raised millions of dollars of business okay. so I know how to do it and it's the same thing and you're and you're hitting a brick wall then you're hitting uh, well, a brick wall when you're in I, I, I haven't been actively looking I was okay. like pretty much waiting until I'm I'm done with the course, so I'm, I'm not sort of through so many challenges, but I sort of scream, look, I, I, I always, I witness the jobs, and the requirements are there in this. I think, I think you'll find that more and more, and, um, because fundraising and development, income generation, that's what I used to do, and I still do, but that's what I used to do exclusively in, in, in organizations like the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, uh, so we were generating income operations globally um, and I think more and more you'll see job descriptions that stipulate uh, fundraising experience or relevant uh, commercial experience and so forth and I certainly know that from the headhunters with whom I speak from time to time they certainly are trying to encourage their boards and boards of trustees to look at it in that manner precisely because your skill set in terms of lobbying and income generation in the yeah. private sector would be invaluable in the, in the, in the for profit sector. Um, and even if they don't mention it in the job description, I would still put it forward in front of them. I would agree to <laughs> All of these organizations are so dependent, they call it resource mobilization. Um, the difficulty you possibly have is there is quite a network of people who raise money because they're already there. And maybe perhaps the same thing for the lady in education. At the higher ends, you have fewer jobs. And that's why you're being forced down. So somebody who go, will go out as a teacher um, will be there for 30 years, whereas there's a demand for a huge number of underground teachers. 
and that's your problem. So they'll give you a job if you're prepared to step back. I think you're right not to, um, because somebody should recognize your talent and utilize it. You'll become bitter either way if you go in at a lower end. It's not good enough. The same for fundraising. Uh, your time will come, get your CV properly put together, and most certainly securing any kind of funding is a huge demand these days. It takes a lot to convince them you're good at it, but you get your narrative right. Now we're opening this to the floor, so, and I know people are shy initially, but I know we'll, but I struggle to keep hands down. Go uh, ahead. So my question is about making that lateral move into the nonprofit space and how you leverage your own. A number of us are getting a master's program in a new domain. And how is that viewed and how can we leverage that so we're not forced down and we can make more of a celebrate of what we've done and what we've studied? It depends on the pool. So if somebody comes with your master's and it's a stipulation, that's great. But if someone also has five years on the ground experience um, and they have covered other elements of it, you're still lower down. You have to wait for the opportunity. And there is more and more opportunity coming along. There's a whole focus on, see, it's not the third world anymore, it's the developing world. And it's to develop economies. So there's a whole world out there that needs a lot of people to do that. So getting your masters shows a real interest in it, so they know you're there. Hopefully some of your skills are then very relevant to the job you're going for. I think volunteering as well yeah. also helps because that you know, really resonates with people who are working in the not-for-profit sector because it says a lot about your motivation. If you're prepared to put hours and effort, using maybe for nothing yourself, then it says something about how you're going to align with the culture of the organisation. And networking. Network like mad with people who are in the not for profits that you're interested in. Get your LinkedIn profile up to date, start connecting with folk, lots of cups of coffee with them, and uh, you know, explore the options. So, blindly contact them and say, Look, we talked about what we do. Yeah, you don't have to ask them for a job, no. just say, you know, <laughs> Yes, I'm interested. No, I was just going to say that the LinkedIn is really, really useful. And if you have a good network, you know, you'll always think, oh my gosh, that person I know well in that area. And then you can just link up. And people love to talk about themselves and what they're doing, you know, so they'll gladly meet you for a coffee. And you may get, you know, an inroad or a bit of info about that organization you're interested in or that area. You can then keep up that relationship they may say to you or what you should ask actually is you know is there anyone else that you could put me in touch with and then you build your own little network um, you never ask for a job directly just I'm interested in this area and if something comes up they might think of you or you never know where it could be so it's a very very precious resource I think um, on the volunteering side um, there are many different ways of volunteering, and you and volunteering might conjure up, you know, you're going to be doing some very basic job. In actual fact, you can volunteer as a trustee, for instance. Um, and if you're coming out with a great degree from the London School of Economics, experience in the private sector, then in actual fact, while you may not immediately be a candidate for a trusteeship within one of the blue chip major global organizations, there are a lot of charities who are actively looking and recruiting through headhunting firms, trustees. And so that might be a way of doing it. And I, and I always find that for senior management roles, um, even when I was being considered for a CEO role, uh, a lot of the headhunters were saying, okay, have you been a trustee before? And because that's a, and if you haven't, that's a great thing to do. Encourage that as a, as a means of, and it doesn't require that much time. Um, you might have four, five, six days a year, in actual fact. And you're very much involved in the strategic function of the organization, managing uh, the whole executive team and, and everything below. Not in an active manner, but in terms of steering the ship. So again, and since everybody here isn't completely new, um, the, the possibility of a trusteeship with your credentials is certainly a viable option to consider. I'd also just say, um Beyond the international development sector, there's also, of course, human rights and campaigning organisations where, in the field, 
international experience so it's less of a key thing. So you could also look at doing you know, like volunteering um, Amnesty, but Amnesty and Greenpeace, <laughs> they have local groups. Um, and that's a really easy way to get involved in grassroots activism as well, which would be really valuable for campaigning organisations. I think the only thing I would add is um, be creative about how you collate your experience. So mm -hmm. if you're in a program right now around, so what, what program are you doing? Behavioral science. Okay, and then are you interested in a specific issue area? I'm interested in economic mobility. Okay, so if you've got people in your program that are also interested in that, you might want to get a small group of three or four of you together and kind of look at the landscape and are there organizations out there that could actually do with your skills and approach them and say, hey, look, there are three of us, we're, we have these skills, we can see from what we read even in the public domain that you guys have issues with this, we can help you address this and do in your like vacation time, two, three week short consulting project for them, you'll get a ton of experience, you're showing proactivity, you're building your networks, um, and you're testing if that's something that you'd be good at and you'd be really interested in as well, and you're working with your friends. That's kind of great. <laughs> yeah. um, hi, I'm actually one of the plants. So okay. the people here to talk during the networking after you've made the switch, so I moved from five sector from PR agency to the World Wide Web Foundation set up by Shifton Berners-Lee and Ben Berners-Lee, mm -hmm. um, to promote the internet for everyone. Address some of the things people are raising, because I've lived through them and recently. One is sort of making a lateral move. I think, you know, I applied for a comms officer job and advocacy officer jobs, which were lower than what I had, and I just got the title when I got the offer. Um, <laughs> and I also said, you know, can I have a pay rise six to 12 months in, like, give me a shot? That also works. I mean, there's ways of taking a risk and saying, right, I'll do the entry level job if I can also carve out some more strategic stuff. So, yeah, then you have to do some grunt work. But, you know, as my boss trusted me very quickly, I was taking on much more responsibility and moving up in the organization. Um, the other thing I would say is that I've recently hired someone else who came from private sector who didn't have experience working in the NGO world, but he had a blog about tech rights and digital rights and internet access that was amazing. And he tweeted about it, he approached me when he's on masters like you guys are now and just said, can I do an internship? And I said, I looked at his online profile, I was like, what, this guy's only worked in like marketing at Reuters, what does that have to do with anything? But then I saw how informed and passionate he was and I've now hired him. So, you know, it doesn't have to be an internship, or sorry, an intern while you're like doing your masters, I mean, be creative about how, and don't be afraid to like approach people and try to put out some thought leadership on the issues that you care about. Yeah, no, and, and that's a really good point about this person who was really active on social media. Um, I've experienced this as well. You come across a lot of CVs and so forth, and you know, a lot of them have great credentials. But you occasionally come across somebody who's either really active on the social media space and promoting a specific cause and going well beyond duty, and you think that stands out. And I know that tends to have very good reception within the hiring teams. And uh, and I would certainly encourage uh, people to do that. The other thing is, in terms of um, you might have a project idea in mind. So you're passionate about a cause. Uh, and you think uh, mobility and so forth, well, maybe there's a specific project that you have in mind that you'd like to test out. And if you were to send in a team member or a senior team person, um, senior person uh, within the organization, actually, forget the HR, just straight up, and, and say, look, this is what I do, this is what I am, and I'd love, you know, I'd love to test run this, this particular project idea, and, and how can we make something happen? And again, a lot of times nonprofits are looking for interesting projects to back. And uh, and whether that's backing them through a grant or backing them by developing an in-house function, um, both in terms of being active on the social media, but actually coming up with a specific project that you'd like to to uh, to showcase to to the management team. I think those are things that I certainly I, I would think are worth uh, giving a go. Yeah. Yes. I guess I have a different type of question. Um, it would be more actually on 
you guys actually making the move from for properties that obviously nonprofit are looking to spend money. Um, and I guess culturally, how different that was, like working for, you know, nonprofits that maybe functionally, you know, obviously work and their dynamics are a lot different um, from maybe efficiency standpoints or, you know, just hierarchy standpoints and how that this was, that transition over um, from just, I guess, yeah, from profit to nonprofit. Who would like to start a on one? KJ, start with me. You weren't at all. I, I can make a start. Um, um, the thing that blew me away is the excellence of people that I worked with in um, and maybe naively I wasn't expecting that going into it, um, but really passionate about what they were doing. They really cared about what they were doing and they were really damn good at it. And that combination blew me away and it really um, made me up my game every day. Um, so that was one like cultural element that I just didn't expect. Um, the other thing that I expected is it's just a little bit slower sometimes depending on the type of organization you're working um, for. Um, to get things done. So I was used to um, working in projects, facing off to a client, and you know, by hook or crook, by crook, things are going to be done by nine o'clock the next morning. And that's just very different because there's a lot more different stakeholders and a lot more ripple effects of um, what you're involved in. And it's not just up to one client or one person. Um, and so it took me a while to adjust to the pace um, at times, but that's not to say it's always slow. Um, it was just a different type of rhythm. So I'm back on track. Sorry, um, I, um, I I found that having gone from humanitarian to corporate to you know kind of moving around, um, I worked shortly for the um, uh, the World Health Organization, and um, I, I found it incredibly frustrating because. You know, and you're in the sort of corporate world where you're copywriting and stuff like that, it goes quite fast and you don't have 25 people reading whatever you're doing, you know, it's quite efficient. And, um, and I was writing for the WHO and it was like everyone down to the cleaner could block something you'd written. It was crazy. It would get to the last stages and then like the web designer would say, you know, there are too many words and I don't like this, even though the big boss has improved everything. So I think sometimes it can get quite um, frustrating when you're trying to be efficient and you want things to kind of happen fast and they don't. And I think it's partly because there's less, um, the, the, there isn't that profit margin or anything. So things can take much longer. Even if you're in an emergency situation sometimes, you know, you have things that just take much too long and you just think this is, this is crazy. But no one has to prove that they came in on target for that project. So you get a lot of kind of, I don't know what to call it, but a lot of seeping out of energy. And after a while, you just think, OK, fine. Whatever, <laughs> you know, I'm a bit tired now with that project. And it's a shame, because you lose good people, because they get frustrated. Yeah, I would certainly echo that. Okay. Um, so I think probably another reason for that that I find is, so is the issue, is the content matter as well. It's slightly more complicated than if you're writing advertising copy. So I have to work with lawyers on really complex issues to try and then turn it into something that's really compressible. Yeah, compressible and exciting and engaging. So that take that's a really long process. So I'll write something that I think is good and then I'll send it off to them and then it gets changed completely and we've got something in, in total like legalese that most people aren't going to be able to understand. So that's definitely a challenge. Um, and another thing that I found um, with the move was that strategic decision making tended to be a much more democratic process, which has both pros and cons. So it's quite nice, I suppose, to be involved. Lots of people are involved. But it can be another source of frustration as well, because it just means things take a long time to get decided, um, which I guess feeds into what you were saying as well. Um, Sometimes you're just craving senior management to make 
the decision for you and tell you, and then you can get on with your bit of, bit of it. Um, and sometimes those processes really do go on for, for far too long, and that's something that I really didn't ever find in the private sector. See, that's quite historical in that people would sign up to these organisations for the good of their fellow man. So the cleaner was there for her fellow man, and the CEO was there for the fellow man. So therefore, there was no other um, driver. There was nobody saying, if you don't get that coffee out today, we're losing the client. Everybody's reason for being there was very valid and it causes a sort of a constipation and historically this is the problem in the organizations that people went in for the good of their fellow man they are can be uh, frustrated and um, feeling dispirited about what they then joined and they, then they become part of the problem so it's being addressed and they're trying to make these organizations more like the for profits the same as what's the share price but it is very difficult to find as compelling an argument out as we'll sack you if you don't get a copy on tomorrow because it doesn't tend to happen i think you need to embrace a healthy degree of um you need to have a certain tolerance for ambiguity maybe um it's not shareholder value there's other factors and maybe they're more complex and, and variables that, that change and evolve and and they are, they are, they tend to be more democratic organizations. So I always like to tell people just a healthy degree of being able to tolerate that. Not a bad thing. If you think you're going to be working for something that's very clear cut, black and white, you may not. You're probably better off on the trading floor and you'll know right away whether the deal is good or not. Who else is uh, interested in, okay, over there? I think I'm one of the kind of opposites. I, I actually started up in the corporate sector, um, went into non-profit about two years after being in the corporate sector. I just knew that I wanted to work more with people and see the application of finances towards making impact in people's lives. So I worked, moved from the city to working at London School of Hygiene and then working in government. But I also did international work in my 20s. And then I got headhunted back at KPMG. And actually, when I sat there and got hit by it was because of the international experience in such a short space of time. I actually took three weeks to turn down the job. And a lot of it was gender issues as well, because at that point, um, I'd been interviewed as a job, even though we talked about flexibility, I found that, well, with, with the for profit sector, the description of the work was more that you could be a generalist or a specialist, so you could share roles, like you mentioned, but with KPMG and other of profit sectors, I found that the, it was more rigid. And when I interviewed some staff members who were leaving the person I was taking over, and it was female, she was 29, it's such a rigid position, I can't I can't transfer my role to someone else. So if I have to fly off today, I have to do it today. I have no notice. And I have one child already, so it was basically, that's not for me because I want to be able to have a role where I can be a generalist and a specialist. So I stayed in the non-profit sector for a while and and I think and now my my, my interest is actually do I want to move back into the corporate with what I've learned from the non-profit sector. So that's my and I think you talked about um, basically the fact that the strength of pros and cons with working in both. And for me, I haven't seen the non-profit sector, I'm thinking do something strategic level. So I'm doing an MBA, the global MBA. Um, can I not do something at the strategic, strategic level to bring, build the models of seeing with the partner with the profit sector and deliver more comprehensive services and using the skills of both organizations? And there is, seen that there is a lot of engagement between the corporate world and the nonprofit world, and yeah, I think it's increasing. And, um, and also, you might, you know, if you are in a corporate space right now, you may want to use that as a platform to engage. With the uh, with the nonprofit that you're interested in, possibly getting into, without letting them know that that's what you're getting in touch for. In other words, you can say, "Hi, I'm from Barclays, um, and I wanted to talk to you guys about X, Y, or Z." And you start a report, you build a conversation with them, and, and conceivably you meet various stakeholders from that organization. And then you step back, and then somehow, like pure coincidence, it just so happens that you develop an interest in that in that organization, and you bring it to their attention. Um, the fact that you are in a corporate space actually provides you with a specific platform to leverage if you're 
if you're creative, um, in terms of starting a conversation. And I think I, I've, um, I think uh, if you can try to avoid the cookie cutter route into an organization. I've I've had very little success with that. You know, it's always been much better in terms of uh, well, if you have a, if you if you don't mind caffeine, having coffees with people, it, it really helps. And you can have a different type of conversation. These exploratory chats are really invaluable, and they allow you to shine in a manner that is um, that's disarming because you're not being scrutinized under the spotlight. You're being yourself, and you can convey certain thoughts and and, and ideas that uh, that you might struggle to do otherwise. So. I also just like to say, just generally, there's also an in between that we haven't talked about, which is corporate responsibility. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of opportunities in that area, and it's a growing part of you know, corporation. So if you're in somewhere like KPMG or Barclays, they have strong corporate responsibility programs that you can get involved in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's you know. correct. And you still get your bonus at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're still married to that culture, of the co because, like you say, there's benefits of both. And corporate responsibility, you can at least, you know, you'll have the corporate sort of benefits that things get done um, very quickly, and and you can still feel like you're doing something. Is that of interest to anybody here? Corporate CSR, corporate social responsibility, that sort of stuff, or are people really interested in getting more into the just the nonprofit space? Silence. <laughs> yeah, I did some project work on it and I actually found it really interesting. And it is actually, and I saw it a few years ago, and it is definitely hard to get into it. Um, but I, I've done some sort of project work on it, so I've experienced it doing it through ILO or different organizations, and that was really good getting into, into the corporate space. But, yes, it's, it's very key roles yeah. that have yeah. come up. So it's like, oh, wait, just explain it. So yeah. Even with the experience, it's, yeah, it's really. Yeah. Now, before I, I think, before I take that question in the back there, just following from your from that thrust, mm -hmm. uh, and I know all of you or a lot of you have a passion for policy. I would imagine um, there's public relations firms who get hired by a lot of nonprofits to put forward their arguments uh, to a wider audience. And so again, you're within the non you're within the private sector uh, in a manner um, that allows you to expand your wings on the policy side, and you could then subsequently move that into. Uh, here's a question in the back, and I'm thinking that perhaps time-wise, we're being told that perhaps. Yeah, I'm sure people got plenty of questions, but it's just hard. Okay. When you've got so should we do two or three more questions and then wrap it up? Yeah, yeah. and then plenty of time. Be sure, there's plenty of time afterwards to ask more specific questions of, of the panelists. So there was the hand that went up out there. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to say, um, in South Africa, there's a big part of it is that economic empowerment, and, and a massive component to that is. You need to work a lot with the community to empower them to start businesses. And I worked a lot with that, and generally, as, as starting as a newbie several years ago, it was easy to shove people into those kind of roles because they need to do it. And it's, it's unfortunately, it's often a, a box sticky exercise. But I found it that because it's a force on the country, there were lots of of groups where you would meet within your industry then discuss how you could um, start community programs and it, and it actually in a way drove a massive sector of a hybrid between non-for-profit and companies that are forced to do it but a lot of good can be done in that space but you still work within your culture and, and I know that there are lots of those kind of countries that and you need to adhere to them and that I think is a really really good hybrid where you can make massive impact but still work within the structures of the profit. So not so much a question, but but that exists out there and it and it was awesome. I think really good and you yeah. could make it yeah. Yes? So how does transition from the government to non government? Um, well I never worked for the government, but the non profit. Yeah, uh, so I can comment on the government side, but from the for profit to the non profit, I'm delighted. I never looked back. Uh, there is a different pace. Uh, so 
but I can't comment for the government, so I don't know if anybody has had that experience at all. Um, but we should have had some. <laughs> but we do have, what I was going to say, we've got three people. We've got Kristen, Alison, and John, whose details are in the booklet. John, you've made the transition from the private sector into government, haven't you? I so. have, yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, so I went from Deloitte to uh, work in the Cabinet Office, where I helped grow the, uh, I was working in a team that works to grow the UK's uh, social investment market, so we did a lot of work with social enterprises. Uh, and then I went from uh, the cabinet office to work at DFIT. So I head up DFIT's work around responsible business. So the stuff that you were talking about around corporate responsibility is very interesting to me. Um, so I'm more than happy to field any questions about that. Um, just a couple of reflections. Firstly, um, actually my experience of moving from the private sector to government is quite a lot different from what has been described this evening because actually I work, and I think it's possibly because I worked in the cabinet office in DIFID, which are high performing government departments, in my opinion. But actually, I think there's a, a hell of a lot more efficiency in, from what I've seen in government than, uh, than a lot of what I've seen in the private sector. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't just assume that the private sector does things in a more efficient manner than, uh, than the not-for-profit not sector or the, or the government does. Um, but we, we live in a world where we're trying to graduate uh, develop, developing economies away from us having an age relationship with them and towards us having an investment and a trade and a trade relationship with them. So a huge part of what David is trying to do is trying to uh, grow the private sector within uh, the countries that we work in. And the NGOs that we work with have a massive role in helping to do that. <coughs> so they can, A, hold companies to account when they go and do stuff in developing countries, and B, they can go into developing countries to help them sell really useful goods and services to, to poor people. So if you take something like Umpesa, which if you go to Kenya is absolutely everywhere, that has utterly transformed Kenya's economy, and it is delivered by Vodafone. So it, it's just to say that like the not-for-profit sector and the, co and the corporate sector can combine really, really well to create big impact. So I wouldn't just necessarily say I'm only going to look at the not-for-profit sector if I want to do good in the world. Great. Okay, so we're bringing this evening to a close. Um, what I would say is, um, sincerely, if any of you have any questions that you wanted to take offline and, and bounce any ideas, uh, I would be more than happy to uh, to share my whatever wisdom there is uh, with you. And that means drop me an email. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I imagine you could send that out. I can't speak for everybody else, but perhaps. Um, but certainly from my side, I would be more than happy for you to do so. I've, I've benefited a lot from having a mentor. Um, and bouncing ideas from people who have uh, had more experience than I had, and um, and if I can if I can be of value, then I would be any inconvenience whatsoever. I'd be very happy. So it's a polite thing, but I'm encouraging you to do that. And, and as an alum, I'm, I would wish you your success. So. Uh, but I imagine maybe without putting everybody else on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I what I will do. Going through there, but I will share things. I've got written some resources and we've got some things on corporate responsibility which I'll share because I'm sensing there's quite a lot of interest there as well. So we'll, we'll push some materials around your way, and then if anybody does want to follow up and you don't have a chance to have a conversation out there, then I'll, I'll certainly help connect. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you so much for, thank you for coming. Much for